I'm so delighted to have Happy Mammoth as a self-work sponsor. We're only just beginning to understand the vital role that hormonal stability and regulation plays in our mental health. I had a doctor look at me the other day and say, oh, I leave that hormonal stuff to the OBGYNs, and I just shook my head. So sometimes you have to advocate for yourself, and that's where hormone harmony comes into play. Happy Mammoth is the company that created Hormone Harmony, which is not just a supplement for women going through perimenopause, menopause, or postmenopause, but is dedicated to making all women's lives easier no matter what time of life you're in now. They make no compromise when it comes to quality, and it shows. You can join thousands of women who are so very happy with what Hormone Harmony is doing for them. For a limited time, you can get 15% off your entire first order at happymammoth.com. Just use the code SELFWORK at checkout. That's happymammoth.com and use the code SELFWORK for 15% off today. This is SELFWORK and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we discuss psychological and emotional issues and what you can do about them, whether that's learning self-acceptance, taking action, or seeking therapy or treatment. Eight years ago, I extended the walls of my practice to reach those of you who might already be knowledgeable about mental health treatment, but also to those of you who might say, you'd never darken the door of a therapist. And yet, you are here. I'll answer your questions while I invite you to take a few minutes for your own self-work. The message is one that is so valuable to people to realize that just because you're functioning doesn't mean that you couldn't have underlying emotional pain and deep emotional pain. That is so important to remember. And sadly, our mental health profession probably still doesn't follow that thinking. Welcome to this week's edition of Self-Work. So many of your emails tell me what's on your mind and heart, and receiving them means a lot to me. One such email this month was very touching. It's from a woman whose mother died when she was very young. I'll read the entire email to you later in the episode, but these particularly poignant sentences struck me, and I quote, I often envy people who seem really happy with their daily life. It's almost like they have an inner secret on how to enjoy this tedious routine, and I was never really able to decipher how to do it. I still remember the feeling of being happy and content with life before my mom got sick, though. So at least at some point, I knew how to do this. It's almost like the death of my mother broke something in my brain that I cannot fix, no matter what I try. I want to try and answer this listener's question as I've worked with many people who have felt that their lives as they knew it then died along with a parent. It's more talked about when a child dies that a parent will never be the same. But the other way around, it happens. I'll do my best to answer with what I've learned, and as always, would love to hear from any of you who could add your wisdom and experience to the discussion. Feel free to email me after you've listened to this, and I'll talk about your comments anonymously, of course, right here on Self Work. Before we get to that, you know, drinking AG1 is one of the gifts I give myself every day, and they're a wonderful and regular sponsor of self-work. So if you want to try it, it's a great way to give us some support. It's important to me that the supplements I take are of the highest quality, and that's why for years I've been drinking AG1. Unlike many supplement brands, AG1 conducts relentless testing to set the standard for purity and potency. Quality for AG1 isn't just a buzzword, it's a commitment. And at each step of the process, AG1 goes above and beyond industry standards. I know I can trust what's in every scoop of AG1 because they obsess over product quality, the standards of their manufacturing and sustainable practices. Taking care of your health shouldn't be complicated And AG1 simplifies this by replacing all those multiple health supplements, like your multivitamins, digestive aids, immune support, and more in just one simple scoop. AG1's ingredients are heavily researched for their quality, and I love that every scoop also includes prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes for gut support. I've partnered with AG1 for so long because they make such a high-quality product that I drink every day. So if you want to replace your multivitamin and more, start with AG1. Try it and get a free one-year supply, a free one-year supply 
a vitamin D3 plus K2, and five free AG1 travel packs with your first subscription at drinkag1.com slash self-work. Again, that's drinkag1.com slash self-work. Check it out. You'll be glad you did. I never met my paternal grandfather, and I was always curious about him. There was a painting of him in my grandmother's home, and I loved his eyes. They seemed very caring. He died suddenly from a massive heart attack on the eve of my aunt's wedding. My dad was only 15. I'd ask him about all of that from time to time, yet my dad would only say, I don't remember much about it. What I know now is that my dad couldn't go there with me. I'm pretty sure he remembered a lot. This month, I received a particularly poignant email from a woman who'd watched my TEDx talk and then looked me up. I want to read it to you. I imagine you have a very busy routine, but I'm reaching out because I coincidentally saw your TED talk. One point that I've hardly ever seen brought up with such clarity is how non-classic presentations of depression can have such a special, cruel aspect to the life of the sufferer. People, doctors, family, friends, partners have, from my experience, learned that depressive people are the ones that lay down and don't have enough energy to shower, eat, or smile, which can only mean that if people are, for the lack of a better expression, a functional being in society, they can have many issues, but depression certainly isn't one of them. This confusion has followed me for decades on my quest to understand what was and is my inner issue since its presentation was never classic depression. Sometimes it does feel really soul-crushing, although I was and am always able to function. If I'm not depressed, what am I then? I've been on and off therapy since my teenage years, although I found it incredibly powerful to recognize patterns of behavior and help me understand them. I must be honest when I say that I never really felt relieved from my emotional pain. I learned how to look at it. I learned that it was there. I can see it. But still, not one professional could help me really be free of it. I wonder if that is even possible. I had a somewhat traumatic upbringing due to the very early death of my mom. As any usual cancer case, her death was slow and painful. Although I cannot fathom the amount of pain my mom felt, I certainly will never forget what it did to me, my childhood, and all my family members in the process. This has changed me forever. It has changed all of us forever. It is a strange feeling because I was old enough to actually remember how, or rather who, I was before it happened. And I guess the center of all my sadness is this longing to become that person again. The person I was that was lost forever. And although I could grieve my mother's death, the death of the life I would have had if she hadn't died is something that I could never really fully recover from. I'm sending this email to ask you if in your many contacts with people who have such a presentation of depression, could you ever meet people that actually manage to be cured of it? I don't mean in becoming non-suicidal. I mean genuinely feeling happy about things consistently. I'd be most curious about what these people did because at this point, 20 years after my mother's death, I am out of ideas on what to try. I am fit, exercise regularly, do not consume any type of drugs. I eat well, I have friends and a spouse, and I join in on social events. I volunteer and help others that are less fortunate than me. I function well, have a job, pay my bills, and by all measures of any normal person, I'm doing fine although I hardly find any joy on my days, and I'm very aware that it sounds extremely ungrateful to think like that. I can recognize that my suffering is borderline ridiculous compared to what happens in this world out there, but the truth is, I wake up, I do stuff, I sleep, then I repeat. I find that pattern incredibly tedious most of the time, although I hardly ever think about taking my own life. I couldn't really tell you one single reason to want to keep doing this for 50 more years. This has been my life for the last 20 years, and although I have learned to expect very little in terms of happiness, I often envy people who may seem really happy with their daily life. It's almost like they have an inner secret, and I read this to you before, on how to enjoy this tedious routine, and I was never really able to decipher how to do it. I still remember the feeling of being happy and content with life before my mom got sick. 
So at least I know at some point I knew how to do this. It's almost like the death of my mother broke something in my brain that I cannot fix no matter what I try. I would love to receive any contact from you. And then she says, I always find it amazing to receive some kindness from people who are able to understand that people who are highly functional can also be hurting a lot. I find this to be a rare thing. Well, for one thing, let me say that I am so glad that my TEDx meant something to her. Believe me, I've heard from many people who say you get something or you're talking about something because this is not about me. It's about the message. The message is one that is so valuable to people to realize that just because you're functioning doesn't mean that you couldn't have underlying emotional pain and deep emotional pain. That is so important to remember. And sadly, our mental health profession probably still doesn't follow that thinking. And some clinicians will be fooled by a bright, smiling person that walks in and says, I don't know why I'm here. But let's get back to this listener. She's talking about both the impact of her mom's death and the very difficult realization of remembering being far happier, far more content, and not being able to recreate that feeling. Responding to this is hard. I don't want to offer anything that might seem to her that she's not doing something right. Maybe she's done everything she possibly could think of. And it certainly sounds like she's tried very hard to build a productive life. Other therapists have not been able to help her feel better, yet the longing is still there. What would my life have been like if my mom had lived is a question that haunts her. You know, it's more than ironic that so many Disney stories and movies start out with the death of a parent. From Bambi to The Lion King, both one and two, to Frozen, to Cinderella, to Tarzan, one or both parents die. But real lives aren't Disney lives. Happy endings aren't always so happy. But what I want to do today is to offer some ideas. I can only hope they'll help. I wrote her and told her I was using her email here on self-work, so I hope she'll be listening. Here are four things to think about or actually to write about. First, let me be quick to say, this kind of loss is something that is never-ending. Her mom's life ended far too soon, and that is tragic. But let me tell you a story about what I learned about grief from a woman I worked with years ago. I've used this story before, but it's very poignant here. She was a mom to two children, both of whom died in a fire. As she described what had happened and how she felt, I assumed she'd lost her daughters within the last couple of years. That was how intense her pain was. I found out that it had been 20. Her other children, the ones she'd had after the deaths of their older siblings, were saying to her, Mom, we're right here. You're so lost in the past, you're not present with us, and we want and need a relationship with you now. She looked at me and asked, But how can I ever stop grieving? What we came to together as we worked collaboratively about this was that her grief wasn't going to stop, but its prevalence, its intensity, in every hour of every day, is what can lessen. She felt as if she were abandoning those two daughters, the ones who died, if her grief didn't consume her every day. We worked on that, as she, in a way, had to forgive herself, allow herself to live today. I'll never forget her, and I've heard others who've lost moms or dads or children say the same thing. Your grief helps you feel connected to the person who died. I still have these intense emotions, this intense pain when I think about not spending more years with them. And yet, that very intensity can keep you stuck. So it's a bit of a conundrum. Here's a second idea. This listener doesn't mention her dad or other relatives, only saying that everyone's lives were changed forever. Sometimes when one parent dies, the other parent feels so overwhelmed by their own grief that they forego parenting. So I would ask her, how did her dad's grief or her mom's parents' grief affect her? If they label their own grief as never-ending, then she may have absorbed the idea that that's what grief is. This is so important and frequently happens, either through death or divorce. One parent leaves or has died, and the other parent falls apart and loses their ability to parent. Thus, the child is thrown into an incredible sense of isolation, 
and dependent on their own personality and means of coping, they'll do everything from taking over in a pseudo-adult kind of way, thus ending their own childhood, or they might seek other relationships to wrap themselves within. You'll hear this dynamic as described by someone having daddy or mommy issues, usually because the child was abandoned by that parent, which has left them with a yearning. I've always thought that particular phrase was kind of harsh, and I much prefer when someone simply says, you know, they seem to need a lot of attention. So I don't know if this happened or not, but it can certainly make it more difficult to continue trying to move through your own grief. So let's take a break, and we'll be back in just a moment. Do you and your partner text all day, but mostly about who's going to pick up, who's going to get groceries? We can so often fall into these habits, even when it may look like you're communicating. That's where the Paired app comes in. This is how it works. You and your partner both download the app, pair together, and the app will take care of it from there. Every day, Paired gives you personalized questions, quizzes, and games to stay connected, deepen your conversations, and have fun. The best part is that you can't see your partner's answer until you answer yourself. I often prescribe something similar to this for couples, where they have time to respond rather than react. Whether you're just a few dates in or have been together a long time, find the time to connect with your partner and nourish your relationship. With the Paired app, it's easy and fun, and it only takes five minutes a day. Head to Paired.com slash selfwork to get a seven-day free trial and 25% off if you sign up for a subscription. Just head to Paired.com slash selfwork to sign up today. Now, here are some other questions and ideas I'd like to ask. What do you remember about your mother? How did you feel around her? Was she the emotional anchor of the family? How did she talk about her illness or her death? Was the severity of her illness open in the family, or was her imminent death kept secret? All of these questions are vital to know the answers to, because talking with her about her illness could have helped you as a child. If she couldn't do that, and many can't or won't, then the family doesn't usually talk about it either. And so this immensely tragic thing is happening, and yet no one's saying anything. I've had many people come into therapy saying, my grandmother or my dad or my brother or whomever couldn't talk about how sick he was, and so I never got to say the things to them that I wanted to say. So we helped to process that. One of the biggest gifts my dad gave me was after he'd had his first heart attack. I was 16, so he was around 45 or 46. He called each of us one-on-one, -on -one, my mom and my two brothers. He called us back to the ICU, and he told me he wasn't afraid to die. He didn't want to die, but he wasn't afraid. He talked about it, and I've never forgotten it. If your mom did talk with you about what was happening to her body, I hope she gave you permission to go on living. You know, we all think that we're going to know how, you know, well, if I had a terminal illness, I know what I'd do. Well, not really. So she couldn't talk about it, didn't know how to talk about it. That's completely human. That's completely understandable. But it may have made it harder on you. I do have some ideas on how you could process all of this. Obviously, retrieving the person that you were isn't possible. You also must remember that you were viewing the world as a child back then. Now, you're an adult and have an adult's view of things. What would make your life content as a child might not make your life content as an adult. But it seems that way. Now, life feels much more complicated. Everything would be better if mom, but again, you don't know that. All the information you have is not what could have happened, but what did happen. Your mom did die. You can get stuck asking, what if? Because those questions don't have answers. I hear and see people all the time looking for that one thing, the one domino, so to speak. If that thing hadn't happened, the rest of the dominoes wouldn't have fallen the way they did. Life would have been better, happier. But do you know that to be true? That's assuming that all the dominoes would have fallen the way you wanted them to, that your mom would have lived to a ripe old age and you wouldn't have had to handle such a tremendous loss. You can wish that, but you don't know that. None of us do. We have absolutely no idea whatever else could have happened. Another loss, more joys, who knows? All we know is the way life happened 
along the way. So, as I like to say here on self-work, what can you do about it? Again, it's not an easy question to answer because of the depth of your loss. But here are some ideas. Could you switch your focus? You may be stuck on the impact of your mom's death, but what was the impact of her life, although far too short? Can you write about what in yourself or even in your kids, if you have them, reminds you of your mom? You want to honor her life. She mattered, not only because of her death, but because she lived. Right now, her death has grabbed most of the attention, of course. But can you remember and honor what she gave you in the time she had? Now, this may bring more grief. It's inevitable, I think, that this would happen because this line of thinking would lead to the question, but what if I'd had more of what she had to offer me? But you don't know. But you'll be able to see if you especially write about it. And journaling and writing can be so important. That's actually been shown by research, by the way. You can see in black and white the impact she did have. Here's another idea. I've used this a lot with my clients who've lost parents. Something else you can try is to write a letter to your mother. Obviously, she won't get it or read it. You can also do more than one. And you can write to her about all the things that have happened in your life that you would want her to know that she's missed. But there's a second very important part. Write a letter back to you. One that you imagine your mother would have written. How would she have responded to these things you're telling her about? Be they difficult things, be they harsh things, be they joyful things. And how would you imagine she would be now? What I want you to see, if you can realize, is that maybe you've internalized her more than perhaps you might have realized in the past. What does that mean, internalizing your mom? What comes up for you when you think about her? What do others say, oh, your mom would have loved this, or your mom used to do this or that? What are your own memories that have lodged themselves in your mind? In some ways, this exercise is once again honoring the idea and giving that idea life of what could have been, but what you also can imagine it would be like now. It's like your mother is present in this moment. Here's one more idea for healing. Have you ever sought out other maternal figures? Maybe a woman in your church or your neighborhood, maybe an aunt, or simply an older friend or a woman who works with you. She would obviously not be your mom, but she could offer you that kind of energy, and she could be part of you moving ahead. Now, there are people who view a trauma like this woman has experienced as justification for not having a good life. I don't hear that at all from this listener. In fact, she identifies with perfectly hidden depression. She knows that she's got a perfect seeming life, but she does feel an emptiness. She doesn't mention children of her own. Maybe she's not going to choose to have them. But realizing in some way, either through having her own children or doing things for other people that are vulnerable, like children, might also act in a healing way taking over the role of mother in her own life in some way, either realistically or metaphorically, moving ahead with the circle of life as the Lion King crew sang about so beautifully. In a few days, I'm going to experience something strange for me. It'll be the five-year anniversary of my oldest brother's death. His name was Adam. And I'll be then older than he was when he died from cancer. It's an odd feeling, one that saddens me for him, his immediate family, the rest of our family. His wife also died a couple of years ago as well. It certainly makes me realize my own gratitude for my life and the people that I love and I'm lucky enough to have in my life. It makes that gratitude even greater. I'll never know the why of that or the why of other friends and family dying the way they did or how young they were when they died. Neither will any of us. You can believe a reason or a rationale, of course, that's a personal decision, or a part of how you understand the world. But I can hope, for this listener and for all of you, that you can grieve and feel joy, that you can miss your loved one and lovingly connect with others at the same time, that your own life doesn't end along with the person you now miss. As I said, please feel free 
to email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com with any comments or concerns about this topic. Thank you so much for being here. I forget at times to ask you to subscribe wherever you listen. That really helps things. And of course, leaving a rating or a review is just as good or better. It shows the people who are considering listening to self-work that, gosh, somebody just last month said this podcast really helped me. So that's a way of pumping energy into self-work here in our now ninth year coming up in the fall. That's incredible. I also want to let you know that in the next two or three months, I'm speaking a lot of places, both virtually and in person, honors college students, energy contractors who want to talk about how to make mental health more of an open conversation with your employees, a doctor's clinic who wants to train their staff about the dangers of perfectionism and depression, and a company who just has hired me to talk about basic issues about depression and seeking therapy. You are by far the largest audience I reach. And I would love to talk with you about what might be possible to work out. Just email me again, ask Dr. Margaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. And last thing, I have signed a contract for a second book. It will be a workbook. So it will be a follow-up to Perfectly Hidden Depression, but we're going to dig into the 10 traits of Perfectly Hidden Depression, something I did not do at all in the first book. So it will be both different, I think, and hope that it will be more approachable, And maybe even give you the courage or the stamina to go back and do more of the exercises in the first book. There were a lot of them. Thank you so much for being here. I'm truly grateful for every last one of you. Please take care of yourself, your loved ones, and your community. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.